So, before we throw ourselves into thinking about a plan for influencing change with evidence, we need to start at the beginning. We need to ask some really important questions. And this is one of the main priorities of this course, is to give you the space away from your own particular projects, programs, and institutions to be able to ask these questions, to stand back and to critically think about them. So firstly, what is the relationship between evidence and policy? You clearly all feel there is one, otherwise you wouldn't have signed up to come on this course. Now, in the academic literature, in policy research literature, there's a range of different models or theories that describe this relationship between evidence or research and policy. And it's worth having a quick look at these. The first model, sometimes known as the knowledge driven model, is based when it comes to us from the natural sciences. It's been with us a long time. And essentially what it says is that a constituency of researchers or knowledge producers produce research or research evidence. And when it's found to be useful and relevant, it is absorbed into policy formulation, policy making, policy implementation. So this is a linear relationship. On the one side, you have the people that produce knowledge. Often these are experts, scientists. And on the other side, you have people who work in policy, who use the knowledge. We then have the political model. This describes a more tactical use of research and evidence. And here, in some ways, the tail is wagging the dog. It's society, it's the policymakers and the political process which generates a demand for new knowledge and new research. It demands solutions to problems. And so it shapes what research is produced and how it is used. This is still a linear relationship. The knowledge producers and the knowledge users are in two separate camps, but now it's the knowledge users which are shaping the research agenda rather than the other way around. Thirdly, we have something called the interactive model. Here, there are very blurred boundaries between producing knowledge and using knowledge. The production of knowledge, whether that's academic research or other kinds of knowledge, is connected to the demand for knowledge. One drives the other. They have a sort of symbiotic relationship. So they interact. This is not linear. It's much more complex. And finally, we have the gap model. Now, the gap model in some ways is similar to models one and two in that it regards the researchers, the people that produce research evidence as separate to the people that use it. And the barrier to evidence use is mainly seen from this gap that prevents researchers from communicating effectively with research users. And so people talk about ways to bridge this gap particularly through better research communications. If only they didn't speak two different languages and they didn't belong to two separate uh, sectors, then more evidence and research would get into use. Now, these models might seem to you a little bit simplistic. Perhaps you don't subscribe to any one of them. Perhaps you feel that it's a combination of these models or theories that describe the interaction of evidence with policy. But what I would say to you is this, even when we talk and think about these issues, it's worth reflecting on how our institutions are organized and what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Even if we might think that relationship between evidence and policy is interactive, it's complex and so on, we often don't behave as if that was the case. Consider this, there's a huge emphasis in most sectors on 
translating research, knowledge translation, the idea that if you could just get the research and make it more accessible and less technical and get it into the hands of the right people, good stuff will happen. Well, that largely conforms with model four, the gap model. So it's really important that we think hard about the underlying assumptions we might be making about the relationship between evidence and policy before we develop our plans and the practical ways that we're going to increase use. Now, this is not an academic course and we don't want to give you an awful lot of theory and academic literature to read, but there's two more particular contributions to this field. I just think it's really worth highlighting because they've been so important and influential, but they are just two examples of many. One is really quite old now, and it was uh, originally credited to Carol Weiss right back in 1979. She was interested not so much in which of those four models is the most accurate, but more in time. She believed it took a long time for research evidence to enter into policy and public discourse. She saw research evidence as less of a linear uh, relationship between a particular report or a particular piece of research that then influenced a particular policy area. She looked at multiple forms of knowledge, multiple types of evidence that over a longer period of time gradually and perceptively entered into public consciousness, a sort of percolation of ideas. She described this type of research impact as conceptual impact, which we'll come back to later. But the point here is it is both nonlinear, but also takes a long time. Many academics subscribe to this model because it's rather comforting for them. It's this idea of contributing to knowledge rather than feeling you have to contribute directly to a policy change. Another very important uh, contribution in this field came from Sheila Jasanoff a bit more recently. Now, she was concerned with technology studies. However, her ideas have far greater ramifications than just in technology. She described very uh, compellingly the way that science is completely interrelated with uh, society and politics. In fact, they were interdependent of one another. So you cannot separate them. Um, you cannot have this gap model. Scientists are a product of their socioeconomic context. The funding for science is a product of the socioeconomic and political context. The two complement each other. What science is generated, what knowledge is generated, how it's generated, then subsequently how it might affect society is part of more of a complex system. Okay, so now we're gonna look a bit more at how this might relate to your work that focuses mainly on policy areas, institu particular institutional contexts or particular programs. And there's two really nice um, descriptions of what's going on that I think I are worth sharing with you. Um, again, there are many others, but these are particularly well known and I think particularly thought provoking. The first is known as the garbage can theory. And uh, it was Michael Cohen that came up with this. Again, this is very old, right back in 1972. And he did a study of universities, of all things. And he looked at how they were organized and how they used evidence and knowledge and how that related to uh, how they were administered and managed and the decisions they made. And what he discovered was that these policy processes within institutions were dynamic, unpredictable, and quite frankly, chaotic and pretty irrational. So the very idea of individuals looking at evidence and making rational decisions based on specific pieces of evidence around particular areas of policy was really challenged. 
Secondly, we have John Kingdom's work, also quite old now, but I think it's still quite relevant, particularly to those of you who are working in a more advocacy type role outside of government. John Kingdom described three streams. The first stream is the problem stream. Now, the problem stream is essentially the social or political issue you work on. So these problems exist in our societies. They develop, they evolve, but they're there always, whether we're working on them or not, whether governments care about them or not. Child poverty, social exclusion, inequality, resource scarcity. These are problems that exist and manifest themselves in different ways in different contexts. This is the problem stream. Then you have the policy stream. The policy stream are essentially the people who work on this problem um, or work on a problem. They might be policy advisors in government. They might be uh, NGOs uh, lobbying and campaigning on these issues. Essentially, they're the experts who uh, have found themselves to work on particular issues. And finally, you have the politics stream. The politics stream is what happens in the more in the public domain. It's the things which are high on the political agenda at any given time in any given place. And of course, this is constantly evolving and changing. Often it changes very dramatically. A particular crisis might, for example, thrust a new issue high up onto the policy agenda. Rather like infectious diseases at the moment and zoonotic diseases, for example. And what Kingdom argued was that it's when these three streams cross, you have a window of opportunity to influence change. When the problem becomes a central concern for the politicians, and you have a group of people working on that problem in the policy stream, you then have an opportunity. I also wanted to share with you uh, how thinking has moved on in this whole area of influencing policy. Probably up until about a decade ago, it was quite common to hear people talk about the policy cycle. And those of us uh, working, whether you work in a think tank, a research organization, uh, a, an advocacy organization or in government itself, it was quite common to think about this policy cycle and how you were going to engage with it. And it was a very simple idea. You would have some kind of agenda setting process. You'd have some kind of policy formulation process and then some decision making and then implementation and then some learning and so on and so forth. And round and round it goes. And individual, individuals and institutions used to think a lot about how to engage with different stages in this process. What has been pointed out, and this links back to this idea of complexity and dynamic systems, is it's rather messier than this. First of all, you've got to consider all the different actors. Here we just have some examples. And these actors are connected to different stages in the policy cycle. In fact, they're connected to multiple stages in this so-called policy cycle. They're also connected to each other in many different ways. And none of these connections pay much attention to what stage you are at in the policy cycle. In fact, once you consider all the different causality between actors and between different policy processes, that nice, simple cycle ends up looking uh, rather more complex and nonlinear and messy than it did at the beginning. So something to consider, to keep into the back of your minds as we proceed through the course. So next. We've looked at the, the relationship between evidence and policy, and now we're going to talk about evidence. Now, again, you've come on a course that's about shaping policy with evidence. So you probably all have a pretty good idea of what you mean by evidence. 
but it's really, really worth interrogating this before we proceed. Broadly speaking, there's three kinds of evidence. There's evidence about a problem, there's evidence about an intervention, and quite often you'll have evidence about a target population or evidence about the context. But within evidence, we mean many different things. We might mean academic research, you know, sort of rigorous peer-reviewed research. And within that, we could be talking about many, many different kinds of, of research and evidence. Some of you might be familiar with randomized control trials, which for a long time were regarded as the gold standard um, uh, for evidence that should be influencing government policy. You may have various forms of content analysis, observational studies, case studies, and so on. Some of you, I know, because you work with uh, community level organizations, think of evidence more in terms of people's lived experiences, citizens, and citizen voice. Of course, not all evidence, or not all research, I should say, is primary research. A lot of research evidence, particularly produced to, to ad for government advisory uh, functions, is actually evidence synthesis. It's about looking at existing evidence, mapping it, identifying what's relevant to the problem you're concerned with, and you know, systematically reviewing it and uh, putting it all together in a way that is accessible to decision makers um, and also making the evidence more available through the use of various kinds of evidence platforms and so on. So an awful lot of research evidence is actually synthesis, not primary. Now, when we look at these different types of research evidence, we really need to stop and consider this important issue of whose knowledge counts. This is particularly been the focus in development studies, but I think it is increasingly the focus in other fields as well, particularly health as well, but beyond health. Whose knowledge counts is, uh, are you primarily interested in academics who publish in peer reviewed journals? Or are the audiences you're trying to influence primarily interested in that field? Why, why is that? Are you actually much more interested in practitioners and their experiences and their best practice? Are you working in a context where governmental statistics, um, governmental knowledge uh, is regarded as more important than other types of knowledge? Why is that? What about INGOs and their policy reports? So non-academic, what we call in academia grey literature, that often cites evidence, even produces new primary research. What about journalists doing special reports and special investigations in the media? What about everything that's on social media? People who claim to have insider knowledge or expert knowledge. And what about the citizens themselves who I mentioned earlier? People's lived experiences that may run contrary to what's in official documentation or academic research. Something to think about, we'll return to this later. So, next question we need to consider. How does research contribute to change? This is a question that vexes a lot of academics and researchers. And I think it's a really important question for anyone interested in using research to improve outcomes or policy processes. Generally, at IDS, we're interested in four different types of research impact, we call it. So the contribution that research or evidence or knowledge can make. In the top left, you can see something called conceptual. And I mentioned this earlier. This is Carol Weiss's idea that the real value of evidence and the real value of research and new knowledge isn't in the short term, make, finding short term solutions to problems or technical solutions. The real value is longer term. It can change the way we think about something. It can raise awareness. It's making a contribution to knowledge. It might be fundamentally changing the way we understand some aspect of the world. These are conceptual changes. The top right, you have something called instrumental. Instrumental impact is the one I think probably most people on this course are thinking about when they think about how they want to make better use of evidence. 
it's certainly the one that most people that fund research are thinking about. And this is where new evidence or new research can directly influence policy or practice. It can prompt a change in direction that you could attribute to that piece of evidence or that research and that knowledge. Bottom left is, some, bottom left is something called capacity building. Now, capacity building is probably more commonly um, considered within a more research type environment. Um, but often it's also something which NGOs think about and civil society organizations think about and governments sometimes. It's about a research process that actually strength strengthens the capacity of people to use research evidence or a research process that actually strengthens the capacity of communities or different groups to be connected into a policy formulation or policy implementation process. So it's a change in people's ability to use evidence that empowers them in some way. And then bottom right is one that we feel is very important based on our own work in our own programs at IDS, although sometimes it gets included in with the capacity building. And we call it networks and connectivity. Networks and connectivity is about changes in relationships changes in who is connected to who. Often through the generation of evidence and research and knowledge, you're building new partnerships between different types of institutions. You're building new coalitions. You're building new connections between different government ministries and different governmental functions. Or you're empowering communities and citizens in new ways. And it's this change in the network that is one of the best indicators, in the shorter term at least, to the impact that evidence and research has had. So see here are some questions to consider in relation to these different types of research, different ways research might contribute to change. How does your project that you work on currently and the kind of change that you think your project could make in the world, how does that relate to broader change? So how do those more immediate, more instrumental, or capacity building type changes that you think your project can deliver? How do those relate to the wider changes in your region or your country or in the world that you are interested in and committed to? Second question, what kinds of changes are your donors or funders expecting to see? Does your idea of the type of change that you can contribute to with evidence, how closely does it conform to the ideas of your beneficiaries? your research participants, your partners, your funders, and so on. And thirdly, what can you actually do? This is all very conceptual, very abstract at the moment, but what can you actually deliver as a project, as a program, as an institution? And how will you monitor progress? How will you know if you're delivering it? We will revisit all of these points later in the course. So we've looked at evidence and policy and their relationship. We've looked at the kind of contribution that evidence can make. And then I think we need to talk about what actually shapes evidence use. Because often it's here that we discover there's things we can do to improve evidence use by addressing some of these challenges or some of these factors. Now, clearly the credibility of the people producing the research is an important factor. The accessibility of the research is an important factor, and we've already mentioned that. Sense of ownership is an interesting one. So if you're on the outside and you're lobbying a particular powerful group of actors and you have your evidence and they have theirs, if they don't recognize your evidence, if they don't see it as credible and they don't feel they've had any part in, in producing it, will it, will it change their behavior? or the communities you're working with around their lived experiences of a particular policy intervention, will they recognize the evidence you produce as something that they own, that they've helped produce, or will they see it as something produced by people on the outside? Of course, the perceived quality and rigor of evidence is important, particularly uh, when it comes to that kind of idea of gold standards, RCTs, academic research, and so on. In development, there's a big debate about northern knowledge versus southern knowledge. Is enough value placed on knowledge produced by researchers in the global south compared to researchers from large, long-standing institutions in the north? 
A huge one here is the degree to which the research evidence and knowledge that you're producing or brokering actually fits with people's current values and understandings of the world. It's very challenging to present an individual with evidence that is completely contrary to their understanding of how things work. Is it relevant? A lot of the time, great research and great evidence may not appear to be relevant. If it doesn't appear to offer a solution to somebody else's problem, it can often be ignored. There's also a whole set of capacity issues around our capacity to produce re research and to use research. So that applies maybe to people who conduct research, but it also applies to people who are expected to make use of that research. Do they have the skills, the competencies, the capacity to do those things? Are there the structures and platforms in place for sharing knowledge? This is, of course, a big focus if you work in knowledge management. Are there incentives to use research? You know, we may, you've come on this course, presumably because you're excited about the idea of research and knowledge improving policy. But are there always incentives in place? If you're a policy advisor in a particular political context where the pressure the pressure is to produce viable policy options, quite understandably, in a democracy. What if the research isn't providing you with those viable policy options? What if the research just makes things more complicated and more uncertain? Where's your incentive to use that knowledge and incorporate it into your briefings to government officials? Your ability to communicate beyond academia, I think we've covered that. Trust and relationships. I talked about networks earlier. In our research at IDS on research and evidence use, we found the biggest factor in research uptake is trust. Individual and network connections, I think we've talked about that. People and relationships are what really get evidence into use. And legitimacy through association. This is, this is about whether you can increase the perceived legitimacy of your research through whom you work with. So it's connected to networks. So if you're working in partnership with government, then your legitimacy in the eyes of people from within government is going to be far greater, for example. OK. So. I'm now going to talk a little bit about influence and you're going to see this diagram again during this course but I just want to quickly introduce you to it. So when we think about shaping policy with evidence we're thinking about influencing change and it's really worth at this point to stop and think about this idea of your influence as, as, as an institution, as a project, as a program. So on the left hand side of this diagram we see something called sphere of control. Now, our sphere of control is the things that we do. So if you're running a project in a particular organization, it's the projects, the things the project produces, the publications, the activities, the meetings, and so on. And that is within your sphere of control because largely it's up to you what you produce and what you do. You decide, as long as you've got some budget to support it, you get to decide what you do. That is in your sphere of control. But we're not really interested in that on this course because this is about influence. So in the next bubble, you have something called your sphere of influence. Now your sphere of influence is everything you do that involves others. It's who you work with. It's your partners. It's the people that come to those events or read those publications. And it's in this area that you can influence change directly. And we call these direct changes that you can uh, that you can contribute to outcomes. So these are outcomes, changes in behaviour that are within your sphere of influence. Very important. Then on the right hand side, you have your sphere of interest. Now this is different to your sphere of influence because your sphere of interest relates to the wider state the wider environment or policy environment that you work in. And changes in this area are not entirely within your sphere of influence, but they are connected to your sphere of influence. 
And here, changes that you have contributed to would be changes in the wider environment. And we call this impact or development impact for those of you who do work in development. And we want to contribute to changes in this sphere. But, we're, but we cannot claim 100% credit for the changes that happen in this sphere. If you see a change, perhaps it's a change in uh, learning outcomes for a particular uh, group, age group of children in a particular uh, country or region. You cannot claim that the research evidence and other work that you did back over in your sphere of control can be totally credited with bringing those changes about because there are so many other factors that will have brought those changes about, many of which you had nothing to do with. But you're still interested in this. This is still what gets us out of bed in the morning. The impact, the wider changes within our sphere of interest. Now we're going to come back to this because it's really important when we start to think about how to take a more strategic approach to influencing change with evidence. So connected to this is something called a theory of change. Now, this is not a theory of change course, but we do need to talk about it. And so I know some of you from your applications are particularly interested in this or and some of you are already aware of this phrase. For, for many of you, it might be new, which is fine. A theory of change is essentially a description of how and why a desired change is expected to happen in a particular context. So you might have a theory of change attached to a large program that's intended to address some issues that relate to, say, water scarcity in a particular area. And there will be some kind of theory as to why what you're going to do is likely to result in changes that will help address that problem. And most of the time, theories of changes are ne theories of change are never written down. They're in our heads. They're sort of they're assumptions that we've made. But increasingly, over the last few years, particularly in big research programs, it's become quite common, uh, and in development programs, it's become quite common to actually write down your theory of change. Um, but most of the time, it's something we don't think about. It's a sort of uh, subconscious thing. Um, it's there, but we don't really discuss it. Now, nested within a theory of change, because this is a course about evidence, nested within your theory of change, whether it's written down or it's subliminal, subliminal, is something called pathways to shaping policy with evidence or impact pathways. And this is a particular bit of the theory of change, which deals with a series of hypotheses of how we think evidence will be used by who and how this will lead to change. And this relates to everything I've just been talking about, our understanding of evidence and the relationship between evidence and policy uh, and so on. And the impact of evidence. So this impact pathways is specifically about how evidence is going to contribute to change. Now, you have to start somewhere and we're going to provide you with a whole set of tools on this course for, for kind of understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it that will lead to practical things that you can do differently and better. But a good starting point is something called the problem and solution tree. And uh, many of you will be familiar with this. And this is just the beginning. Now, a problem and solution tree is useful because it can start to help you flush out what perhaps your theory of change actually is, and specifically what you think the role of evidence is. And the way it works is this. You start with a problem. What is the problem we're dealing with? And for researchers, this can be hard because often they will think about this in terms of a research question. But even for researchers, the research question is couched within a problem. For those in advocacy or government, it's perhaps a bit easier to say what they think the broadly th think the problem is they're dealing with. You then say, OK, so if that's the problem, what do we think the causes of the problem are? What contributes to that problem? And you list as many things as you can. And then finally, the branches of the tree are, OK, so if that's the problem and that we think these are the causes of the problem, 
what might be some of the things that need to change to solve the problem. Now, these are the outcomes. And remember I said earlier, not the impacts, not the wider change. The thing that will solve this problem is all children will have access to clean drinking water. No, it's not that. It's what are the specific things that need to change that might fall within our sphere of influence that would contribute to addressing that problem. And because this course is about evidence, we would ask you to think about this in relation to knowledge and evidence as much as possible. What does knowledge and evidence got to do with some of the changes that need to happen to contribute to solving the problem? So I'm gonna give you an example. Oh, the thing I'll say before I move on is, of course, this tree and how you think about these problems, it, it feeds into your theory of change and it fe that feeds into your pathway to impact, but they all feed off each other, right? And you need to kind of explore these issues and it's, it can be quite an iterative process. Okay. So I'm gonna give you an example from my own uh, career. So long, long ago, before I worked for the Institute of Development Studies, I worked for an NGO, well, a number of different NGOs. And one of the projects I worked on um, was looking at um, how we could take a more evidence-based approach to addressing High scale, a high scale of institutional childcare in the country of Moldova. Now, Moldova at the time was by far the poorest country in Europe, had not yet joined the EU, and they had historically relied very heavily on very, very large institutional care for very young children and infants, which was a kind of hangover from when they'd been part of the Soviet Union. And so the, for us, the problem was this was a, this was a childcare crisis. You know, the well-being of children was being harmed because so many were being placed in these very large institutions at a very large age. And when we thought about what contributed to that problem, the causes of the problem or the roots of the tree, we thought, well, look, there's clearly an over-reliance on large-scale institutions. There's a lack of alternatives. There's a lack of family-based care in Moldova at that time, such as foster care. But also this is a social and political norm. So politically, and socially, it was just accepted due to the history of that country. Uh, most people, particularly people in positions of authority, didn't really see it as a problem or a priority. So then we thought about, well, what would contribute to a solution? And what's that got to do with knowledge and evidence? Well, we need an evidence base to inform change. This is clearly something that's greatly required in order to move things forwards. We need to raise awareness of the developmental damage that's done to young children when they're placed in these large institutions. We saw this as a central tenant of the whole thing. The, the, past, the problem was that develop, they had developmental learning difficulties and therefore if you could raise awareness of that, supported by an evidence base, things might change. And finally, of course, you need political will. This was a political problem. It was a policy problem. Something had to be done by the Moldovan government specifically. So there we are, easy peasy, right? Now, what actually happened is that there was nothing wrong with this analysis in, as such, but we didn't really understand the political context fully. And so we as a foreign organization assumed that we had to lobby the Ministry of Education because on paper, they had control of the institutions in Moldova. So we commissioned a very, very nice report from UNICEF, very, very nice research secondary research that pulled together, it synthesized existing research and pulled together all the evidence of the developmental damage done to young children by growing up in these large institutions. And we presented this to the Ministry of Education and nothing happened, nothing changed. And it was only after a longish period of time that our Moldovan colleagues said, what are you doing? It's not the Ministry of Education you've got to talk to, it's the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance at that time in Moldova would drove all key policy decisions that related to public spending. And for the Ministry of Finance, the key issue was cost. They, they were quite horrified by the evidence produced by UNICEF on the developmental damage done to children by being in these institutions, but still nothing changed. So then we commissioned a much shorter and simpler report. And this one compared the cost of running these institutions to the costs of family-based care. And what we found, what it proved to some degree, was that actually, contrary to what most 
people believed in Moldova at that time, large scale institutions were actually very expensive to run. So we, we presented this new evidence to the Ministry of Finance this time. And two weeks later, uh, the head of the country office in Moldova was phoned up by the prime minister's office and told that he would like to, to attend a press briefing where he would announce Moldova's uh, uh, long-term uh, commitment to, to large-scale institutions. They were going to move to a new family-based policy. So this is about testing your assumptions. We make two kinds of assumptions when we're thinking about evidence, policy and practice and influencing change. We make contextual assumptions. These are assumptions about the external context. For example, you might have assumed there's a lack of political commitment in a particular part of government. And you might be assuming that that is, the, is central to the problem you're dealing with. But we also make something called causal assumptions. Causal assumptions are about the causal links in, our, in that pathway to impact I talked about earlier. So, for, for example, in this Moldova case study, we assumed that evidence of poor developmental outcomes for vulnerable children in care would lead to buy-in from all critical state actors. And there were two problems with that. One, well, it wasn't true. So it, it wasn't the right evidence to tip the scale in favour of a new policy within the Ministry of Finance. But also, we hadn't understood the critical role that the Ministry of Finance played in that particular policy sphere. Test your assumptions. 